Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth in a series of events highlighting the various tools available to book through Indus experiences. With the vaccination drive at full steam and much of the world planning on reopening safely, we hope that we will be able to get back to exploring at some point in 2021. Indus experiences offer a range of bespoke and special interest group tours to destinations across the Asian subcontinent, North Africa, and the Middle East. And we're putting on a series of events to highlight where and how you can see some of the fabulous destinations they can take you to. Today's event focuses on Morocco and Jordan, and we will show how an understanding of the geological dimension can give depth to the experience of travel. This experience can be greatly enhanced by an understanding of the rocks you see around you and the vast history they reveal about times long ago before man stepped foot on the earth. This is particularly true in Morocco and Jordan, where, for instance, a rich fauna of a warm, shallow Devonian sea provides a startling contrast to the present day desert environment of Morocco. Whilst in Jordan, the low elevation of the Dead Sea provides evidence of ancient grinding movements of the African against the Arabian plate. Introducing us to everything about these tours will be renowned geologist Dr. Danny Clark Lowe's. Before we hear from Danny, we will receive an update from the Sia Zaga, Director of Marketing for Indus Experiences. Following the two presentations, we will move into a Q&A section. And if you have any questions for Danny or Asiya, simply place them in the Q&A section, which you'll see below, and we will do our best to get through all of your questions. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce Asiya Zaga. Thank you, Howard. And thank you everybody for joining us today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Asiya. I look after the marketing and making the team the office. We are Indus Experiences based in Harrow. We are a boutique tour operator, family run and family owned. We specialize in creating bespoke tours, uh, tailor-made tours and special interest group tours to, uh, across Asia. Before we begin, I would like to say a huge thank you to our clients who have been in touch with us, who have written in, called in, um, you know, with concern to our family, friends, colleagues, uh, back in India and uh, we are in touch with them on a daily basis as you can imagine and uh, hopefully now the things do seem to be easing up especially with the arrival of all the aid um, from across the globe um, they've stepped up their vaccination program and, and things do seem to be looking up so hopefully that situation is arrested soon uh, back in the UK, we urge everyone to please go and get your vaccinations if you haven't done so already. Uh, I'm looking forward to having mine, uh, despite my grey hair. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not above 36 yet, so maybe in a couple of weeks. Now, those of you who don't know Indus experiences or have not seen any of our products, I would quickly like to take two moments and just introduce it very quickly um, before we hand over to Danny. This is our website, indusexperiences.co.uk. You can come here and if you, um, you can search here by destinations if you know uh, where you would like to go or by experiences or have a look at our special interest portfolio. Today we're looking at geology, so I'm going to come into here and go into geology directly but feel free to have, have a look about and see what else there is. It's too much to cover here today, so I'm not going to attempt. <laughs> right, so this is our geology program. Um, Danny will be taking us through the Morocco and Jordan um, tours that are scheduled for 2022. Apart from that, we do have a couple of tours which were supposed to go out in 2020 but had to be postponed. So these include our Nepal tours. We have two for that. Uh, two, two of the Nepal uh, departures, one being led by Danny again um, to Annapurna region and Mustang, and one led by Professors Mike Searle and David Gellner, uh, which was due uh, to go out in September 21, but again, like I said, looks like it will be postponed, maybe to 2022 or 23. Another one of Danny's tours, which was going to Bhutan in November uh, 21, this may be postponed. Um, again, we're not sure of the dates yet, but you can come here and have a look at the itineraries. Our geology trip to Oman, this did go ahead uh, in 2019 and it was very popular. 
um, and we, we we had to do a rerun of that because this is scheduled for 22 um, and hopefully it can it can go ahead as scheduled one of our newest tours um, is scheduled for September 22 uh, and this is to Kyrgyzstan it's 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 still actually in planning stages so the itinerary and the pricing are not up yet but they will be updated here as soon as as soon as they're ready now you will notice that some of these tours do here say alumni on the top right hand corner now this is because these are part of our oxford and cambridge university alumni travel programs um, Sometimes they do have spaces on these and they're happy to open them up to alumni of different universities or even to non-alumni. So if you are interested in any of these, they do catch your eye, then do get in touch and, and we may be able to uh, off, uh, off, offer you a place on there. Now, these tours typically do um, have about 12 to 16 participants. And of course, like I said, they're all run by experts um, like Danny. Um, so if you are interested, you can get in touch by phone, by email, you can request a callback, or if you would like to come in and see us face to face, I'm happy to report that as of uh, Monday, uh, we are officially able to um, organize face to face meetings here in the office, socially distanced, of course, with all the measures in place. Um, we had a client come in earlier this week, and it was absolutely lovely to to see to see them, and and take them through their uh, through their itinerary and what they wanted to do. So, if you are interested, then 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 we are able to do that. Alternatively, we can set up a consultation by Zoom, if you would prefer, or by email and by phone. So, without any further delay i'd like to hand you back so you can we can all hear about uh, the geology trips that danny will be leading to morocco and jordan thank you very much for joining us today so let me now hand over back to howard who will connect us to danny shortly lovely lovely thank you very much Asir. um obviously yes we do hope that the situation in india improves very very quickly and we can get back to exploring the country as soon as possible um, and we wish everyone all the best over there. Um, for those of you who would like to get in touch with the team at Indus Experiences after the, after the event, we will place their contact details in the chat box. Uh, and if you don't know how to get to the chat box, just click on chat at the bottom of the screen and it will appear on, on the right hand side. Uh, and we'll put uh, contact details in there so that you can get in touch to discuss some of those lovely tools that Asir was talking about there. Uh, but now we're going to move on to our main presentation today. And for that, I would like to introduce Dr. Danny Clark Lowes. Danny is a geologist educated at Cambridge and London universities who has given industry training courses on geology at locations throughout the world. In addition to publishing scientific papers and books on the subject, he has been leading geological tools for inter experiences for some four years now. Dr. Clark Lowes is well qualified to reveal the details of the geological history of the rocks seen on tours to Morocco and Jordan, having devoted much of his career to the study of the geology of North Africa and the Middle East. So Danny, thank you, over to you. Thank you, Howard, for that kind introduction. And I'm going to talk about the, or give you a, a tour of both Morocco and Tunisia and show you some of the geological and cultural delights of these two countries. Uh, this will be one tour, but uh, in, in the form of a talk, but uh, it will also actually be two Indus tours, which are taking place next year. Now, Morocco and Jordan lie at each end of the Mediterranean, and indeed Morocco has uh, uh, an Atlantic seaboard as well. And on here is here is Jordan, and here is Morocco. Um, they both belong to the Afro-Arabian plate, um, which moved northwards and collided with. Um, Europe, Eurasia. Um, but on this map, a striking feature is the, um, uh, the, the, the um, Red Sea here. And this Red Sea opened 20 million years ago, which to us geologists is actually quite recently. So for most of geological history, 
Africa and Arabia were one. Now, the northern margin of the Afro-Arabian plate is this boundary here. And this separates the Afro-Arabian plate from the European plate here and the Anatolian plate here. Most of this boundary runs through the Mediterranean Sea, but in the very northern part of Morocco, um, it forms the Rif Mountains. And in the northern Arabian plate, it forms the Zagros Mountains, which we can see rather more clearly on this cartoon diagram showing the same boundary that I've just been describing. So here are the Zagros Mountains um, right up in Iran. And the reason I focus on them is to make clear the point that Jordan here lies quite well within the Afro-Arabian plate, quite a bit south of that plate boundary. Whereas, and, and therefore the geology we'll look at in Jordan is very much the geology of the hinterland of this ancient continent. Whereas when we look at uh, the geology of the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, let's just uh, move to the next slide. Here, here's the high Atlas in Morocco. What we're looking at here is um, a mountain chain quite a bit south of the plate boundary, but it's an inverted basin. That's to say a rift basin that formed in a Mesozoic times and was inverted in, in the Cenozoic. And to the south of the High Atlas, there's a very major fault called the South Atlas Fault, which runs right along through Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And so you can see here on this interpretation uh, that forms the High Atlas and the Saharan Atlas. Good, well, let's now um, start our tour of Morocco. And here's a view of the High Atlas. And as we cross the Atlas, um, by the way, the, the name Atlas comes from the Greek Titan God, uh, Atlas, and you might remember he was the one who held up the heavens in all those pictures of the Greek gods. Um, as we cross on this road over the high Atlas, um, we come on the south side to Eight Ben Hadou. Um, this is a rather fascinating medieval town, which is much loved by Hollywood directors. And the film Gladiator was made here, uh, or scenes from that film at any rate, and uh, also scenes from the 1970s film Jesus of Nazareth. And when I was last there, um, people came running out and saying, um, I'll be Mary and uh, I'll be various characters from the biblical story because they're all ready to um, play that role. Um, now, we come to a simplified uh, geological map of uh, Morocco. Um, I'm afraid it's a bit busy. It's um, not quite as simplified as it might be. You can ignore these white lines that run up here. Uh, these are depths to the lithosphere, and we don't need to concern ourselves with that. But as we cross over the high atlas, we cross over two major thrust faults, which uh, uh, are one of the major structural features of, the, of Morocco. And this one is the South Atlas Fault that I mentioned already. Uh, this is the North Atlas Fault. They're both thrust faults, that's reverse faults. And then there's a bifurcation of the atlas and the middle atlas runs off to the Northeast here. And it's bound also by a major thrust fault, uh, which you can see here. And then to the north is the alpine thrust that we mentioned already related to the plate boundary. To the south of the high atlas, we have an area called the anti-atlas. 
And this is a, a, a basement high where we have Paleozoic rocks, which happen to be very fossiliferous and Precambrian rocks as well. On the south side of the high atlas, and we also have these um, yellow areas. These are fallen basins, which are relatively recent depressions in the crust, which are filled with young sediments. And this is the Uazazat uh, fallen basin. Now, once we've crossed the atlas and looked at uh, the fossils in the anti-atlas area and the uh, various other characteristics, so they're very beautiful um, oases here. And of course, once we cross the high atlas, we're into typical Saharan desert uh, scenery and climate. We then go back over the high atlas and over the middle atlas up to Fez, which is positioned up here. And on that traverse, we're going to look at uh, the two inverted basins. That's the high atlas and the middle atlas. And these are uh, simplified cross sections, but you'll see that they're dominated by faults which are reverse faults, or indeed like this one here, a fault which has been both normal and reverse. And that's related to the inversion of these basins when the sediment within the basin was pushed out as a result of compression. So there's a sort of simplified account of the Atlas Mountains. And here is a much more complicated version of the same information. So uh, we're now looking uh, at a very detailed and complex cross section of the High Atlas. And this was some work done by Beecham and his colleagues in 1999. And he um, undertook a, a study of the uh, mountains, a theoretical construct here, uh, so that this is both geometrically possible and geologically plausible, as they say. So all the line lengths here have been retained in this restoration. Um, now, as I say, it is quite complex, but let's start at the top. Here are these Jurassic rocks, which are exposed at the surface. And this is the surface here, the land surface with the mountains of the High Atlas. At the base of the Jurassic section is a Triassic section with salt in it and uh, ancient uh, geological salt. And that forms a De Colmont plain um, on which the rocks can slide laterally and horizontally. Beneath that, you've got a Paleozoic section, which is repeatedly thrust into thrust slivers or thrust slices. Now, thrust sheets is another term. And, um, we can see looking at the faults that these are all reverse faults. And on the south side, uh, some of the fill of the uh, rift basin or the rocks lying within the rift basin have been forced out in an anticline here onto the margins of the rift basin. So that's how the Paleozoic section has behaved. The Mesozoic section has behaved rather differently in response to this compression. Um, and instead you have these pop-up structures, uh, thrust rather the vertically aligned uh, thrusts, um, creating a pop-up structure, which is responsible for the Jebel Tizal and other mountains of the High Atlas. So there's um, an explanation for how the mountains formed uh, within the interior of the African plate rather than at the plate margin. Um, on the north side of the uh, High Atlas, um, you have the North Atlas front a fault. And here's a, a theoretical construct of how these rocks formed. But this is actually consistent with the actual 
outcrop structures that uh, you can see. And here's an example. Heavily folded Jurassic limestones overlain by gently folded myopliocene molasse. This is the interpretation. Here's the actual photograph. And uh, you need to get up close to be able to see this unconformity here properly. But uh, hopefully, hopefully you can see the main point. And here are the structures on the south side of the fault. Um, this is the south side of the high atlas. And um, here we have two cross sections. Um, on the south side, you have four different thrust sheets, one, two, three, four. And that's a, a, a small scale version of the, the boundary. And here, a large scale version showing the, an example of one of these thrust sheets. And you see that it thrusts lower Jurassic rocks over tertiary, Paleogene rocks here. The opposite of the usual succession of rocks, which is what happens with these thrusts. Now, from the air um, or satellite image, and this is a tilted one, you can see that the structures of the anti atlas and the high atlas here uh, are full of folds. And these are the eroded boundaries of folded rocks. And here you can see. Uh, a, a big fold which has been, so to speak, decapitated. The top of the, do the dome has been eroded away. And you see evidence of that here as well. And you can see an example here of a plunging um, fold with the core of the fold there. So the whole area is highly uh, folded and deformed. Um, the highest point of the high atlas is Mount Tubkal, just over 4,000 meters. And for those who are adventurous enough, uh, there's the opportunity to stay on after this tour for an extension to go trekking up Mount Tubkal. And I showed you that view of folds from the uh, satellite image. Uh, here we are. This is two meters. Here's the small scale folds uh, with this Jurassic limestone complexly folded and fractured. And so we move out of the high atlas into the anti atlas and into an area of desert scenery and uh, oases. But before we go on to that, let me just explain how the high atlas are thought to have formed. And this is another diagram from Beecham, a slightly surprising one in that he puts the older rocks or the older events on top of the younger ones. But anyway, we'll work from the top downwards. So during the Triassic and Jurassic time, um, the crust was stretched and the crust thinned as a result and the upper mantle came up to a higher level and released magma up into the rift basin that was forming over this thinned crust. So the crust was extended, pulled apart, thinned, and, and the rift basin formed with normal faults, filling with the Mesozoic sin rift succession. Then in the Cenozoic, in fact, in three different episodes, um, you had compression of the crust. And uh, if you can see, this, this area has been laterally shortened. It used to be that distance. And the contents of this rift basin have been forced out or onto the margins of the basin. And the whole section has been subjected to compression and thrust faults have resulted and stacks of thrust sheets, which is what I showed you in that first cross section diagram. And so now let's look at some of the features of the anti-atlas where wonderful dunes can be seen. 
and where also we find these extraordinary crinoids. Um, here's one example, and we'll see some more in just a minute. This is a, a museum example, and these are unusual crinoids. Uh, crinoids are common in the Paleozoic, um, but these unusual ones have a bulbous root to them called a lobolith. And this is a sort of flotation chamber. So these are floating crinoids. Now, crinoids are sea lilies, basically, um, but this variety detaches or was never connected to the seabed as most sea lilies are, but float. Uh, they floated up and down within the water. And they have the most wonderful um, structures, which I, I'm going to show you. Um, but what they're evidence of is a warm, shallow sea. So in Devonian times, that's about 400 million years ago, this part of Morocco was a warm, shallow sea, a great contrast to the sort of landscape that we see at present in this area, the uh, Saharan desert landscape. Now, the previous one was a, a beautifully presented museum specimen, but this is how it looks actually on the ground in the field, unadulterated, so to speak. And they're very large specimens. And here we can see the crinoid stems, lots of them. And often in these limestones, such as in the Carboniferous limestone in the north of England, you find crinoid stems, crinoid, um, crinoid ossicles, I mean, which um, are a result of the breaking up of these stems. But look at this intricate uh, pattern in here and this lovely design here. Uh, just an enlargement of this crown, it's, as it's called. And um, here, another museum specimen uh, showing a colony of crowns and a juvenile crown down here. But uh, it's time to move on. And another um, of the fossils for which Morocco is really famous is these Devonian orthoceros um, straight cone nautiloids. So they're nautiloids, they're um, like ammonites in many respects, but they're the Paleozoic equivalent. They are separate um, uh, evolutionary development though. And um, that's what they look like in the outcrop, but they are heavily quarried and mined and polished and uh, exported all around the world. And here, we have a wonderful bathroom sink, and above it, um, some of the black variety. So the marble comes in, in two colors, which is due to iron staining, producing this brown or bronze variety with the straight cone orthoceros and the coiled variety here. So uh, this, this uh, marble tabletop was um, excavated in uh, Morocco, was uh, polished up and turned into a tabletop in Italy, and then exported to America, where it was sold at um, an oil industry exhibition and bought by myself, and then brought back to the UK, where it uh, lives in our sitting room here. And a prized possession it is. Um, now, another uh, variety of fossils that we can see in the Antiatlas are these Precambrian stromatolites uh, with their wonderful dome and bulbous surfaces. And when you see them in cross section, uh, you see it's a, a folded laminated structure. These were algal mats uh, from, as I say, Precambrian times when uh, life was uh, not in any uh, great developed form, but only um, minute uh, algal mats and such like. So these are found at Air Food, and um, we, whoops, sorry. And the next uh, set of fossils we find are these trilobites, and um, uh, they are 
found in a quarry or, or a outcrop here, um, where you can see quite a lot of excavation has been done and to very good effect um, with these lots of specimens have been found on this occasion. I sometimes find that I jump two slides and I can't seem to get back. Yes. Right, sorry. Right, there we are. On to the next. So um, the next feature that we see is a, a very large scale. It's not exactly a, a fossil. It's um, a, a carbonate mud mound. And these are very large scale. You can see trees here. Uh, they form a small uh, hillocks on the side of the hill here. And they have a very interesting history. These mud mounds were formed in deep water um, on the seabed, a bed which had been influenced by and covered by volcanics. And these volcanics had come up faults which were present within the seabed strata and where a um, large uh, uh, amount of um, brines and hydrothermal fluids were emerging. And they caused the precipitation of uh, carbonate, making these large mud mounds, which were then covered by uh, mud. Um, which was much softer than the carbonate mud mound, so that when um, we see them uplifted, exhumed, that is, and uh, emergent at the surface, all the clay that used to cover them has been eroded away. And you see these sea mounds, sea mud mounds that used to be on the sea floor exposed at the surface. Um, we also find these rather fascinating fossils called trace fossils. So they're not actual organisms, um, but you can see the trace of the organism as it burrowed along and uh, excavated the seabed looking for nutrients to eat. I mentioned that um, we leave the anti-atlas and cross the high atlas and then the middle atlas. And um, when crossing the middle atlas, we go through the Ziz Valley, which is cut through Mesozoic limestones. And although they appear to be fairly horizontally bedded here, in fact, in the large scale structure of the middle atlas, um, we're seeing the same thrust faults with the uh, sedimentary strata within the uh, rift basin being forced out onto the margins. And then we arrive at Fez, and this is arguably the cultural capital of Morocco, and we enjoy looking at some of the architecture and features there. We find time also to go to Volubilis, a Roman city just outside Fez, with uh, the most dramatic architecture and temples, and a uh, Corinthian columns and the storks take a particular like to, liking to the Corinthian columns and build their nests on the top of them. Uh, the last slide was simply to show you that uh, the Romans occupied uh, the coastal parts of North Africa and um, uh, tangerines must have been something they particularly enjoyed because they called their province in Morocco a uh, Tangerine Mauritania. Wonderful mosaics at Bulubilis. And then we uh, find our way to Marrakesh for the end of the trip and have a little bit of time there to see some of the delights, the snake charmers and the souk. So now at time to move to look at some of the geology and the culture of Jordan.
in these diagrams, this uh, satellite image here on the left, uh, you can see the boundaries, just about see the boundary of Jordan and its capital, Amman. You can also see the Dead Sea Rift, this north-south rift fault, major transform fault, which runs down into the Gulf of Aqaba and into the Red Sea. On the right, you can see a topographic map showing that uh, we have mountains running up to 3,000 meters, not quite as high as the High Atlas, um, but most interesting, we also see land right along the transform fault, which is well below sea level, down to 428 meters below sea level. And then in the Dead Sea, we have another 300 meters of water. And below that, we have an amazing 10 kilometers of um, Myopliocene sediments. So a very major basin, geological basin, has formed along this uh, transform fault and is now the position of the uh, Dead Sea. And down here, you can perhaps just see that the calculated uh, displacement on this transform fault is five millimeters per year. Just to show you a little bit more of the geography, you see here is uh, Sinai, uh, here is Israel, and this shows the eastern, northeastern extension of Jordan. Um, and we're going to look basically at the same map now, but with a geology map on the right-hand side. Um, and they approximately correspond to ge ge geographical coverage. The Paleozoic rocks and older Precambrian and Paleozoic rocks of Jordan are exposed in the south, down towards Aqaba. And that's where we go to see uh, Wadi Rum and Petra. Um, in the north, you have a large number of different formations. They're basically all Cretaceous and tertiary limestones, bearing witness to a history of a marine incursion into this area, uh, in fact, covering most of Jordan. But this young feature, the transform fault, 20 million years old, has uh, not only created these deep chasms that I described for the Black Sea, um, up, the Dead Sea, I mean, uh, up here, um, but it also, along its route, throws the rocks up as well as seeing them depressed. And so you've got some Paleozoic and Precambrian rocks uh, along the margins of the transform form. So there's a, a brief introduction to the geology, and we're now going to go and look at uh, Wadi Rum down in the south, um, where the film uh, Lawrence of Arabia was shot. And we will be able to see some of the film locations uh, for that film. And uh, it was here that um, Lawrence uh, assembled his Arab army for the Arab revolt of the First World War, which was an attack across the desert to Aqaba and a, a successful uh, venture, military venture. And we will have a chance to uh, go camel riding for those who wish to and uh, imagine what it was like for Lawrence or indeed for Peter O'Toole uh, as they uh, rode camels in this Wadi Rum. The rocks of Wadi Rum, uh, strangely, are called the Ram Group. And here they are, uh, the Canberra Ordovician sandstones sitting above the Precambrian basement at a boundary that runs approximately along here. And uh, now just to give you a flavor for the Precambrian rocks, these are granitic rocks shot through with dolerite dikes, these black dolerite dikes, which have subsequently been greatly deformed, and they're about two or three meters in, uh, in thickness. Um, uh, and so this is actually quite a mountain that we're looking at here. And so the, the geology of the Cambrian and Ordovician of this region 
um, is very similar to that of uh, southern Libya and southern Algeria, where rocks are deposited. And these are called uh, informally Nubian sandstones. And it refers to the fluvial deposits and some, some thin estuarine deposits uh, laid down on a vast plain uh, within the interior of the African continent, shedding sediment, transporting sediment northwards to the plate margin and to the seas and oceans, uh, Tethys Ocean on the plate margin. Uh, they're characterized by these four sets, which uh, you can see are dipping in this direction. They're all dipping in the same direction, showing that the river was flowing always northwards and northwestwards. So they're interesting um, rocks to look at. And on a larger scale, um, here is the Um Ishrin sandstone, the red sandstone, one of the formations of the Ram group in the Cambrian. And it's within these rocks that the Petra uh, temples are all formed. Um, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit, I think, as we might be uh, running out of time. Um, but once at Petra, uh, we see temples carved out of the Um Ishrin sandstone. This is a Nabataean capital city, as you know, from the first century BC. And wonderful temples. We go, we enter into it through the Sikh gorge and have a, a great opportunity to see these temples, which uh, David Roberts uh, loved very much, a Victorian lithographer and became quite famous with his illustrations of these temples. And above the temples is the, in the Um Ishrin sandstone, is the white Dizzy formation. And um, these rocks are right at the top of this cliff. And uh, perhaps they represent the Dizzy Heights of this exposure. You get amazing iron um, mineralization within these sandstones, because they're continental, you've got uh, oxidized form of iron, which migrates through the deposited sandstones, laying down these wonderful uh, features of what's called a roll front precipitation of um, iron minerals. More of, of the same. And so we pass through Aqaba, where we'll get a chance to look at uh, ancient and present day corals and enjoy a seaside resort. And then we come now to the, to the Dead Sea, and this is the final uh, part of this story. Um, the Dead Sea is a quite extraordinary place. Um, it's the lowest uh, uh, water surface anywhere in the world at 428 meters below sea level. It's not really a sea at all, it's a lake, but it's always been called the, the Dead Sea. Um, Herod was very uh, keen on it because uh, he liked the hot mineral springs and the aquatic plants that you get there and uh, the salt water so he could uh, float in the water. And it's all caused by the uh, transform fault here, uh, up which you've got hot water coming from great depths full of minerals. And the desert environment means that all the water has uh, evaporated um, and the uh, remaining water has become increasingly salty. The way in which this transform fault uh, uh, formed was, as I mentioned, that the um, Red Sea opened, splitting Africa from Arabia in the Miocene. And uh, the sense of movement is one which resulted in the African plate moving northwards rather faster than the, the Arabian plate moving northwards rather faster than the African plate. This is a relative sense of movement. Both were moving northwards. But since Arabia was moving more northwards faster, uh, it caused a transform fault, a left lateral transform fault. And here are detailed maps of the transform fault with all the detailed structure in here. Um, and actually a rather simpler 
map here where you can see there's a uh, cross cutting plot here so that the movement on the transform switched over to the left. Now that's significant because here's a model of such a pull apart basin which creates this sort of geochasm. Here's your geochasm. Um, if you've got transform movement here and here, then you open up a sort of hole in the crust. Here's a more um, realistic, uh, well, this is, this is very idealized. Um, this is a structure that I think you can imagine if you were ripping um, material, uh, you would get these type of rip movements. And so I really must stop. Um, we go to Jerash uh, once we're back at Amman. And on our journey, we will have seen many Crusader castles. And that brings us to the end. And I'd just like to thank um, Peter Del Strada, who kindly lent me a number of photographs for use in this. And um, also to thank Indus Experiences for all the assistance they've given me with the preparation of these trips. And I'm sorry I've gone on a little long. Not too long at all, actually, Danny. Um, and it was all extremely interesting. Um, I, I love seeing those pictures of Jordan. Having been to Jordan myself, it's just wonderful to see some of those those places in real life. Uh, I mean, they look fabulous in pictures, but in real life, they are really just quite stunning. Uh, and the Dead Sea is an experience all in itself as well. So um, <clears throat> hopefully some of the people who are sitting here watching this will think, I want to do that, and we'll go there with you on the tour. Um, we have got some time to ask some questions. Um, there haven't been anybody posted, any, any questions posted yet. Um, so if you do have any questions you want to ask a Danny or a Sia, uh, then do, uh, do place them in the Q&A section below uh, and we will try and get through them all. Um, before I start though, I've just got a couple of questions for a Sia uh, in terms of the tours that are being offered. Um, is it possible so if you wanted to do, just say you just want to be Morocco, is, is it possible to do, to add bits to the itinerary or are they set in stone? Sorry about the uh, stone pun there, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, Asiya, do you want to answer that or shall I? Go ahead. <laughs> um, yes, uh, there are um, extensions offered uh, for the Moroccan trip. And um, there are three of them, in fact. Um, one is to do a trek to Mount Tubkal, and that's a five-day trek. Um, there's another opportunity, which is to go to Isawia on the coast and have a, a brief um, seaside holiday after the, the trip. Um, and thirdly, simply to stay on a bit longer in Marrakesh and enjoy all the delights of, of Marrakesh. Um, for Jordan, we haven't um, uh, got any sort of formally defined extensions, but they can always be discussed with uh, clients as they wish. And there's so much to see in Jordan, of course, that uh, you will want to stay and see as much of it as possible. Um, so my next question uh, is really aimed at the sea. So it's obviously when booking anything at the moment, we have to be wary of things may change. And the government are putting this amber traffic, traffic license with amber, uh, which means that things can change, um, which is fine as long as we know. But what happens if you book the tour and it gets cancelled due to COVID? Thank you, Howard. So yes, you're correct. Right now we are obviously in the traffic light system and I think we will be there for quite some time. Right now, Morocco and Jordan are on the amber lists. Um, it's still unclear what exactly they want us to do because we're allowed to go, but we're not allowed to go. But uh, I mean, these tours are so far, uh, far in advance. We hope that uh, by that time, you know, we, we, we're all uh, safe. Everybody is safe and, and travel can resume as normal. If uh, in any case, if anything has to change, then we do have our flexible, flexible booking conditions in place. Um, so changing itinerary, changing dates, changing um, destinations, it's all possible. Or of course, uh, you know, if things do go from bad to worse, uh, it, your deposits will be fully refunded. So there's nothing to lose um, right now if you just need to book a place. Yeah, and obviously the, the, the dates of these tours are set. So it's not, you know, it, the, the, the tour aren't, is going on those dates. So if you do want to do one of these tours, they are set for those dates. So you just have to book it for those dates and 
you know, you will be protected. And if things have to change, then you will be well informed by everyone at Industry Experiences. So um, if you are interested in booking these tours, then please do go ahead, speak to Rosia and her team and and get it get get going because um, there are very few places in the world like Jordan, I can tell you. I haven't been to Morocco, so I can't speak about it in the same way, but Jordan is quite a stunning place to go. Um, so we have some more, um, more time. Um, no more questions coming, but I've got a question of my own, Danny, actually, about the Morocco trip. You did a lot of lot, lot of talking there about fossils that you will see. Um, so there's obviously a lot of fossil localities in, in, in the Morocco tour. But this, is this tour mainly about the fossils? Is it a fossil collecting tour? Uh, no, I'm, I'm glad you've asked that because um, I get a bit carried away talking about the fossils since they're so fascinating. But uh, it is very much our intention. And uh, the plan is that the trip will be a mixture of um, uh, looking at the culture of um, Morocco, looking at the geography uh, and opportunities for photography um, and opportunities to look at the geological features so that um, all tastes will be catered for. Um, the, the trip through the anti-Atlas is particularly uh, enjoyable because we're staying at oases, and these are very photogenic and lovely places to walk around. And uh, I think that in my presentation, I may have focused a bit much on the, on the fossils and not so much on the oases, but that's just my particular sort of background. But um, no, it will be a, a very lovely tour through the country, seeing a range of different uh, sceneries and uh, as I say, you'll get the geological dimension tacked on as well. Excellent. Um, and just one final question from me about, about Jordan. Um, Wadi, Wadi Ram is obviously, it's just, it's just the most incredible experience and things you can see, but um, a lot of people go there because they want to, you know, experience that Lawrence of Arabia thing. So do, do we see the desert that T. Lawrence crossed at Aqaba in the Arab Revolt and W of World War One? Well, very nearly, not, not exactly, because um, right. when we, on our trip to Wadi Ram, what with the, the timing that we have, we'll be able to see the, the northern end of it, um, where we can see um, where Lawrence prepared for his Arab revolt and assembled his army. Um, and it is actually the most picturesque place, as you perhaps gather from the pictures. Um, he then went off south and west um, across, as you remember from the film, the most amazing flat desert. Um, and we just see that in the distance. But um, since you ask about that, there, there's uh, an interesting um, other side to Indus experiences trips, which are about um, military history. And uh, I know that uh, there are military history trips within um, India, um, but there is a, uh, an individual that I've met who has taken a camel and actually looked at all of the route uh, that uh, Lawrence took and also the other sites along the railway line where he blew up the railway line. And um, he's uh, an expert on this and we were hoping to see if he could come on the trip and um, show us some things, but the timing didn't work out. So. Anyway, it's it's a subject that people get very excited about. Yes, they do. They do, um, and it's very it is it is very interesting. And um, we have one more question, and in fact, we only have time for one more question. So this is the question that's going to be. It's come from Carolyn Warburton. She says, "How active are the trips? Are they full day field trips?" On a typical day, um, we have a good breakfast at our hotel and we'll set off in our um, vehicles, which sometimes are four wheel drive vehicles and sometimes it's not necessary to, to have that, but they're um, vehicles that will either have four or six people in them. And um, we'll find um, a location to stop at for uh, photography and for uh, looking at the geology and looking at the scenery. And uh, then at lunchtime, we'll see if we can find an acacia tree 
to sit underneath and have a picnic. And we found that uh, in, this is the best way to organize things, is to, is to take a picnic with us rather than trying to stop at a restaurant at lunchtime, which can be difficult uh, and time consuming is a real problem. Um, so we have a picnic and uh, then we'll look at other scenes in the afternoon. So we try not to be too much time in the vehicles. Um, and when we stop, we'll do some walking. And sometimes we'll walk up a wadi. And so we'd, we'd walk um, perhaps uh, uh, two or three miles, um, stopping and looking at things. And so we'll get plenty of exercise, plenty of touring and a nice lunch and arrive at our hotel in the evening um, in time to relax a bit before dinner. And often during that time when we might have um, a glass of beer, uh, we might talk about some of the things we've seen during the day and I'd uh, let participants know what we're going to be doing the next day. Excellent. Uh, and Carolyn has actually even said, excellent. So there you go. Uh, and while you were talking there, we had a question from Norman Nimmo Smith. He said, will there be off-road traveling trips to see desert features such as wadis? But I believe you just mentioned that in what you were saying. So that pretty much answers Norman's question too. Yes, I think so. That's right. We, we, will, we will be traveling um, off the road some of the time. Yes, sounds fantastic to me. I'm afraid we've run out of time. We haven't got any time for any more questions. Uh, I noticed that uh, someone here who's this, uh, Paul Newby has said something about a large GS members evening a few years ago. The speaker showed us a spectacular collision between a lorry and a train with a level crossing on the Lawrence R Railway line. Okay. That sounds, that sounds great. Um, thanks very much for that, Paul. Uh, sorry that you had to hit caps lock while you were doing that, but um, we, um, we, we appreciate you telling us about that, uh, that collision between the lorry and the train. Um, I'm afraid that's, that's all we've got time for for today. Uh, if you have any further questions for, for Asiya or Danny, then please do get in touch with Asiya. She's put the deta uh, uh, contact details uh, in the right here, and in fact, they're coming up on the screen right now. Um, so that's how you can get in touch with these experiences. You can go to the website, you can call them, uh, you can email them just to get further information and, uh, and they'll be able to help you with um, information about these tours and the other tours, of course, that are going on. Um, so that is the end of the fourth in our series of events promoting Interest Experiences tours. We have more interesting events planned in the coming months and we hope you can join us for those as well. Thank you very much to Asiya and Danny for their valuable input today. All of the team at Indus Experiences are excited by the recent government announcement that international travel could resume this week. However, it comes as no surprise that none of our major destinations are as yet on the green list. And indeed, we support this cautious approach. We stand by the FDCO and will continue monitoring the situation COVID related or otherwise. On a really positive note, we're delighted to announce that our offices in Harrow are now open for COVID safe face-to-face -face holiday consultations. And we welcomed our first visitors week. We can't wait to help you design your perfect holiday so please make an appointment and pop in for a chat to discuss your trips in 21, 2021 and 2022 when we hope to be travelling to these fabulous destinations again. In the meantime please follow government advice and stay safe. Thank you very much for coming.